friends, this is Gary Rayburn, and we want to encourage you to sit back, listen, and enjoy our Sunday worship service. And we would like to invite you to come and join us next Sunday. Our Sunday school starts at 9.30. Our morning worship service is at 10.30. And we also have a children's church and a toddler church that begins at 10.30. Now, on Sunday nights, we begin at 6 p.m. And our teen service also begins at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. So bring a friend and come join us next Sunday up here at Orchardville Community Church. Now, on Wednesday nights, we get together at 7 p.m. And we have something for everyone. We have kids' clubs for the boys and girls, and we have a Bible study that begins at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights. So come join us on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Now sit back, listen, and enjoy this tape, and then make sure you pass it on.
ago we started this out and we was on Mount Calvary and that is the first mountain that you've got to climb upon and then after that we seen Mount Bether which is a separation Paul said in the book of Romans that he was separated listen to this when we think of separate, we think, well, it was separated from something. He said he was separated unto something. I'm separated unto the gospel of God. God had set that man apart to be able to proclaim the gospel message to the Gentile people. And now today, go in your Bibles to Song of Solomon chapter 4. We'll read one verse there, and then I want you to find the book of Psalms chapter 60, and we'll read verse 6, 7, and 8. Find those two places. The teens will have their first service in their new building tonight. So teens get uh, pumped up for that. It looks really good, that room does. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. How many just can't wait to hear what the preacher's going to say? Thank you for those hands. I do think today I've got something that will help every person in the place. And it's not because it's coming from me, but because it is the Word of God. I've really felt this uh, down through the years. I feel every message I preach is important, but I feel some are more important than others. And I think this is one of these sermons. Because if we can get this in us, it can really do something for our Christian life and our Christian experience. Uh, Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1. Solomon writes, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. She's doubly fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Now, I don't know what I think about that. I mean, ladies... If your man went up to you and said, you've got little black beady eyes and they're set real close together. I don't think you'd take that as a compliment. So I got to looking in some commentaries and what that means, doves have real single vision. They're real sharp, focused, single vision when they look. So uh, we want to give, give Solomon the benefit of the doubt. That's what he was talking about. You have eyes only for me. There's probably a song like that somewhere. Thy hair is as the flock of goats. And I don't know about that neither. <laughs> and one commentary said that it was like black goats from a distance going down Mount Gilead and it looked like flowing hair. And I'm just going to go with that. Maybe that's what, maybe that's what he meant. That appear from Mount Gilead. And now, find the book of Psalms, chapter 60. Psalms chapter 60, 6, 7, and 8. This is interesting. 
Because this scripture, word for word, these three verses can be found in another psalm. And when I seen that, I thought, now, Lord, there's got to be something here. I mean, word for word. God has spoken in His holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem. I will meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. And Psalm chapter 60 is a psalm of testimony. And it was to be sung to the tune of a song that we know not of today, but they knew about it then. The lily of the testimony was what that song was to be, was to be sung to that, uh, that rhyme or whatever they call it. So, so what we're going to look at this morning, again, is something very important. It is about your testimony. It is about what will get you up in the morning. It is about what will give you the, the want to, to be able to share Christ with someone else. Bow your heads, please. Lord, I ask and pray this morning that you will give me the words to be able to convey this message to this people. And Lord, it would be a tremendous blessing in their life. In Jesus' name we're praying. Amen. The word Gilead means wonderful amazement. In Luke chapter 17, there were ten lepers that Jesus told them to go and present yourself to the priest and he will offer the ritual cleansing. And when you go in the Old Testament, you will find very few, like maybe two, people in all the Old Testament that was healed of leprosy. It wasn't an ordinary, all over the day, all a run-of-the-mill deal when someone was healed of leprosy. As a matter of fact, we find no place to where someone was just got over this. Well, friends, it's been a sad one, so turn the tape over and make sure you share this tape with somebody. Pass it on. It had to be a supernatural deal from God for them to be healed and totally set free from leprosy. A disease that rotted away the flesh. It left no feeling in your flesh. You could back up to a fire and you would smell your flesh burning before you would feel your flesh burning. So I'm, I'm thinking that the, high, the priest, with all of their knowledge concerning the Old Testament, this was probably something that they wasn't real sharp on. Because there wasn't a whole lot of people coming in and saying, Hey, I've been healed of leprosy. So I believe that day that Jesus healed those lepers and they went to the priest. The priest probably had to look in the book of Leviticus and find out again. Now, what was the ritual cleansing of this? Because he didn't do it every week. It was something that just did not happen. And for thousands of years and for decades after decades and generation after generation, they probably looked for a healing, but guess what happened? One day, the healer found them. These people that had leprosy on them, and I have to wonder, that was the ten that was healed, they all went running to the priest, but one leper turned around. And he ran back. 
And the Bible says with a loud voice, he thanked God for healing him and setting him free from this. And I have to wonder, that loud voice that they were so used to speaking in, well, they had a little veil that covered their face and they would scream out, unclean, unclean, and that veil would, would shoot up and everybody would think, oh my gosh, it's a leper. And that veil symbolized that that leprosy was just going through the air and maybe it could get on me. And they was often, they would scream, unclean, unclean, and people would flee. And now, because he'd screamed so many years, again he runs up to Jesus, and he's totally made well. And with a loud voice, again, he is proclaiming and screaming, Thank you, God, for setting me free from what I had. You know what I think happened to this guy? I think wonderful amazement happened to him. This leper, this leper of the nine or of the ten, he could have been the one that was the most leprous. He could have been the one that his nose was coming off and things looked haggard and terrible and he may look worse than all the others combined. And there was a wonderful amazement that sprung up within him to know that God come through for me in a major way. And through wonderful amazement, he came back and prostrated himself at the feet of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if every one of us could get that deep within our spirit, the wonderfulness, the amazingness of Jesus Christ, it would really revolutionize what our Christian experience is all about. Let me tell you, when me and my wife get along better than any other time, is when she's in wonderful amazement of me. And me of her. Probably last Saturday morning she wasn't in wonderful amazement of me. For those of you that remember. <laughs> wonderful amazement. I got this from Chuck Swindoll here. There was a preacher I used to like. I thought he was great. His sermons were wonderful as long as I liked him. He lived a clean life as long as I liked him. He was a good worker, as long as I liked him. He was the man for the job, as long as I liked him. In fact, I was really in his corner, as long as I liked him. But he offended me one day, whether he knew it or not. Since that day, he has ceased to be a good preacher. His sermons are not so wonderful, since he offended me. His faults are more prominent, since he offended me. He is not a hard worker, since he offended me. In fact, I don't believe he's the man for the job since he offended me. I'm trying to turn everybody against him since he offended me. It's really a shame that he's changed so much. Wonderful amazement. When we're in wonderful amazement, this psalm of testimony, chapter 60, Israel entered into the promised land and God told them, you're going to have to get go over the Jordan River and from there, wonderful things is going to happen to you. And what they did, and there's an old saying, there are sermons in millstones, milestones, and gravestones. And here that day, the God of heaven would tell them, set up these 12 stones, and eventually your children is going to come by, and they're going to say, what do these stones mean? And as a rock of testimony, you're going to be able to say, God led us through the Jordan River, just like God led Moses and Joshua and the children of Israel through the Red Sea. It was something of a testimony that was going to happen to them. Everybody here, you've got something. You've got a testimony. If you're saved, you've got a testimony. Well, my testimony ain't too good. You know where you get that kind of thinking from? TBN. They don't have anybody on there unless they've been a super duper real rank sinner. You don't have a testimony unless I was a teenage werewolf from hell. And, oh, I got a great testimony. No, everybody's got a testimony. Whatever God has got you through, that is a testimony. But what stops people from giving their testimony is thoff and thoff. F-O-F, fear of failure. I might fail. I've got a newsflash for you. There ain't no might about it. You will. Well, that's not very encouraging. It's truthful, though. There ain't nobody failed any more than I failed. Ain't nobody failed any more than I've failed. Ain't nobody failed any more than I've failed. 
I know of no other preacher other than myself who has went to a nursing home to preach to people in the nursing home and to say, I'm glad to be here in the funeral home with you today. You know why preachers, when they get up to preach, if you keep your eye on them, they're up there and they're, 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 it's like they're checking their belt buckle. You know, but they're really not checking their belt buckle. They're checking to see if their fly is zipped up, what they're doing. It's no good to have your shirt hanging out there flapping in the wind. It's no good. <clears throat> so will you, might you, could you, will you? Hey, you're going to make mistakes, no doubt about it. And the next one, fop, fear of people. Get over it. Everybody is going to stand before God. It don't matter who they are, if they're Donald Trump, Bill Gates, or whoever, everybody needs Jesus Christ. Everybody, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Mount Gilead, wonderful amazement. In Psalms 106, these words are found. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea. Listen to that. He rebuked the Red Sea. He dried it up. He led them through the depths just as easy as he led them through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him that hated him, Pharaoh, and to redeem them from the hand of the enemy, the Egyptians. And the water covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. But look at verse 21. Verse 21. They forgot God, their Savior. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great works for them. They forgot God their Savior, who had done wonderful works in the land of Ham and awesome things by the Red Sea. They forgot their God. I'll tell you what they did. They lost that sense of wonder and amazement. I see these song leaders leading up here, and from time to time you see, I mean, there'll be one that I just really, you can just tell the glory of God is flowing over them. I cannot read people's mind, but I, I, you, you can almost mark it down. When that happens, what is going on in their lives, what is going on in their spirit right then and there, they are having a wonderful amazement of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for them. It can revolutionize our life if we'll climb this mountain and realize every single day the amount of sacrifice and privilege that even God has given us in that sacrifice that we could be saved. Testimony. Lot lost his testimony. When the angels came to him, and in turn he went to his sons-in-law and told them that God was going to destroy the city, what does it say? They laughed. They laughed because his testimony meant nothing to them. Protect your testimony from dullness. I think that's what trips up a lot of Christian people. It just ain't alive and vibrant like it once was. You know, young Christian, that's what they got going for them. Young Christian men are just alive and they're vibrant. They want to share their faith with someone, come and go to church with me. And you know, people say, oh, you got to watch them. They got wildfire. I'm telling you, most churches, there's enough wet blankets around. You ain't never got to worry about wildfire. You hang around long enough like me and you'll be like I am. That's yeah, real good to know. You know, I'm in the way. Yeah, you're in the way. And it ain't the bright and shining way. <clears throat> God has wanting to birth and rebirth that within our spirit that we have served a wonderful Savior and we should be totally amazed about that every single day of our life and not let your Christian experience just to be a whole hum, hum, drum existence. Uh, when it's going to be over, I need to get home and watch the ball game. Those people are not having a wonderful amazement about Jesus Christ. Thank you for those three amens and that one that's right. 
You need to learn how to present your testimony. Everybody here, you need to have about a one or two minute thing that you know when someone asks you, you're going to be able to say, this is what I'm saying. Not, well, I don't know. I, 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 well, but the preacher, if the preacher was here, the preacher ain't got to be here. Wherever you're at, you can present your testimony. And you can do it in a way to where the power of God can move through you to someone else. You don't have to preach them a message. Just present your testimony. Years ago, I worked with a guy who was Jehovah Witness. Man, oh man, for six years, for the first two of them, we fought like cats and dogs. Harold, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He goes, Mark, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. We got nowhere. You know what? I read a book one time, and it said, this is what you should do. This is what I started doing. I started winning then. You know what I started doing? Sharing my testimony. That's something he didn't have. He didn't have a testimony. He never, he never had that time that Jesus Christ had set him free. Share your testimony. It is something of utmost importance. It belongs to you. It is precious. And God can do great things through your testimony to someone else. But no, we've got ego and we've got pride working in us. I'd share my testimony, but somebody might laugh. You know what that is? That's pride. Said in another way, that's ego. Said in another way, E-G-O, edging God out. You're edging God out in what God might be able to do in someone's life if you would just open up your mouth and say a few things. Again, you don't have to preach a message. Leave that to the professionals. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> there are other fears. Fear of being talked about. Fear of standing out in the crowd. Christian people are like Gulliver. How many remembers the story Gulliver? The giant. And who were the little people? What were they called? Little people? What was it? I don't know. I can't figure... I don't, Oh, I can't even pronounce that word. But these, 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 these little people was all over him and taking these strands and putting all over a Gulliver. And here he was, the giant. That's the same way that happens to Christian people. We are a giant and yet held down with little bitty strands of fear that's all over us. And what the devil says about you is what Japan said about America when, the, when, they, when they bombed Pearl Harbor and that main guy in Japan said, I fear we have just woken up a sleeping giant. I'm telling you, every one of us has got an incredible gift to be able to share to someone else. But if you let those tiny strands of fear keep you down, you'll never share it. Thank you, Scotty, for that amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. The J.B. Phillips translation is good. I really like this. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. I like that. Read that again. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. How many gun smoke people do we have here? My cousin. Gary, I was with him Monday, and he was telling me about how much he liked gun smoke. Where's Steve Garrison at? Ain't nobody of guns there. He is. Ain't nobody a gun smoke fan like that guy. And 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 Gary was telling me about different episodes that he'd seen of gun smoking. I got to thinking about about Matt Dillon. Did somebody say Amen when I said that? <laughs> Every episode that I have ever watched, I'm going to read this again. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Now, think of Matt Dillon. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. That guy, it didn't matter how crooked the situation was. It didn't matter how, how dangerous the situation was. That guy was who he was. He wasn't bought off. You couldn't, you couldn't frighten him out of the situation. He was who he was. I got this uh, from a, a, a Dan Betzer book. You realize that gun smoke used to be on the radio? How many knew that? I'll give you a trivia question. Who was the person that was the voice of Matt Dillon on gun smoke on the radio? Anybody? 
That's right. That's right. The same guy that played Cannon. You remember Cannon? You remember Cannon? He was on the portly side. And he's running after a teenager. And he'd show one clip. And in the next clip, he'd show. And he's, he's caught the guy. It was like, that would never happen. And William Conrad wanted to be Gunsmoke, wanted to be Matt Dillon on TV, and they would not allow it. And the reason why, they said they didn't want him sitting down in a, in a, bar, in a bar chair, and when he got up, the chair got up with him. That's what they said. That's why they wouldn't let him be get Matt Dillon. But here's what was spoken on the Gunsmoke episode on the radio. Every episode is how it started. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for, the last man they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. That really describes a person taking a stand, leadership, to me. People want leadership to be strong, but not that strong. It's a chancy job. This man and leaders are, in particular are willing to take chances that other people are not willing to take. They tend to be on guard. And there are times of loneliness. And young people, let me tell you, you're not the only person to experience peer pressure. Every person has to battle this at one time or another. I was telling Steve a, a couple of weeks ago, Steve Hutchcraft, was with me. We went and visited someone. And I told him, it's odd to me that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right in the middle of that chapter that's all about doctrine, the whole chapter is about, about Christian doctrine, right in the middle of it, it says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's what it says. Right in the middle of that. Great doctrinal thesis of the New Testament. And right in the middle of it, God's saying, and right here is something so practical, everybody can grab a hold of it. Well, preacher, I don't believe that. I believe I can run with who I want to run with and just go with who I want to go with, and it'll be all right. You're deceived. Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. <clears throat> Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. These are brand new. But if I'd stick them down in the mud, you know what somebody would say? Preacher, you got your gloves all muddy, right? Your gloves are muddy. I have never in my life heard anyone say, that's awful glovey mud. <laughs> I have never seen glovey mud. Never. Never, never, never. Never seen it. And I don't believe that, preacher. I believe it. Again, I can just do what I want to do, hang with who I want to hang with, and it'll be all right. And God's Word said, be not deceived. Right in the middle of one of the most important chapters in the Bible, be not deceived. I have never saw glovey mud, but I've certainly seen my gloves get all muddy. Man, when you compromise, it always is going to cost one party more than it does the other. The Russian man that wanted a bear, wanted a, a big bear fur coat, decided that he would just compromise because the bear wanted the full belly, so he ate the hunter. The bear got a full belly. The hunter got a bear coat. And somebody compromised a lot more than the other person. <clears throat> Here's my advice to one and all. Climb Mount Gilead. Have a wonderful amazement of who Jesus is. A wonderful amazement. John Newton, overwhelmed 
by the mercy of God and writes a song that we have sung for, the church has sung for 300 years, Amazing Grace. Why did he write that? Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with what God had done in his life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Last year, I preached 13 different sermons on the life of David, and in that, we saw where David at one time, where he was kneeling down. We seen the word David was looking. We seen where David was, was uh, uh, running. We seen where David was throwing. And on and on and on. The one that got me the most is David sitting down. That really impacted me. Because God tells this man, your lineage, your house, your kingdom will never know an end. It will be forever. And David is so overtaken by that that he sits down and just can't fully fathom what God is telling him that my lineage, my progeny will last forever and ever and ever. And there will always be somebody in my lineage that will be a king. And it just overwhelmed him. He was totally amazed at what God was speaking to him. Christian, if we can get there, if we can get there to where we're just overwhelmed and, over, and just totally amazed, we're just amazed that Jesus Christ was willing to save even me. Amazed. Amazed at the work that God is doing in your life, in my life. Amazed by that. If that happens, you don't have to go into church service and somebody up there with J-E-S-U-S, J, you won't have to have that. You won't have to have a Sunday school teacher just begging you to read the Bible. You won't have to have a preacher begging you to pray and have a prayer life. You won't have to have a song leader begging you to enter in what God is doing on that Sunday morning because you'll be totally amazed at who Jesus is. Amazed, amazed, amazed. I want you to see this. This will be the last scripture we read. New Testament now. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7, starting with verse 7 through verse 10. Paul writes, And to you who are troubled, rest with us in this fact. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believe. Because Paul said, my testimony was believed among you. But to be marveled at. church teaches Jesus meek and mild and people yawn and can't wait to get out of the church doors. Jesus Christ in that day will be marveled at of who he is, what he has done, the power that he has will be marveled at. When I was in Israel, <clears throat> the most beautiful thing you'll see over there is the Sea of Galilee. And in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, there were three main cities around the Sea of Galilee. They were Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. I remember getting out that day of the tour bus at Bethsaida, or at, uh, at uh, Chorazin. That is where they get that black uh, basalt rock that they use as decorative rocks throughout Israel. It comes from that one place. But that day it was rainy and just kind of nasty out that morning. I just I remember associating that with that city. But three cities in Jesus' day, major cities, and Jesus said to Bethsaida, Woe unto you. He says to Chorazin, Woe unto you. He says to Capernaum, Woe unto you. For heaven has visited you, and you think nothing of it. Those three cities today are ruins. Ruins. 
And I thought this past week, if we will do and do the exact same thing that those three cities did to where Jesus Christ was in their midst and they thought nothing of it, we will become as dead as those decayed and dying cities are. I don't want that to happen to me. I want to be like that one leper that came back in just amazement. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at what you was willing to do in my life. I don't want to be like the other nine. It's just par for the course. I want to be amazed. I want Katie to go to the piano. Let's see the magnificence and the amazingness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God can do something wonderful in us if we will. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Lord, I ask and pray right now. I certainly don't know anybody's heart in this place. You do. And I ask that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to each and every person that's here. Everybody. No one left out. You're going to speak to each person that's here. Because God, all of us has got growing to do. Myself at the top of the list. And I never, ever, ever, ever want this thing to be a bore and mundane and routine. But God, I want my experience with you to be fresh and alive. And I know that'll happen when I fully recognize who Jesus Christ is. And I see his magnificence and his awesomeness. God, that just, it just springs up within me every day. Lord, it'll help me be a better Christian. It'll help me share my faith even more. And I pray, God, that that is birthed in every Christian's heart here this day. In the blessed name of Christ, we're praying. Also, look up here right now. If there's anyone here, and I, again, with a crowd this size, perhaps there is, that you have not said yes to Jesus Christ, it all starts at Mount Calvary. It all starts there. The young lady sang the song. That, I'm telling you, that's where, it, that's where it starts. Your walk with Christ starts right there. Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, kneeling down and his load falling off of his back. That's where it starts, right there. So they sing, if you have a need, I ask and invite you right now to come, bring, come forward, bring it to him. Don't bring it to this church. Bring it to him and there will be people that will pray for you and with you right now as we sing. You will be the first to break the ice, whatever need you have. Come right on and pray. There will be people praying with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Don't let anybody pray for themselves, church. pray for themselves. Hallelujah. Whatever your need, if you're coming up here for a fresh touch from Him, if you're coming up here for salvation, if you're coming up here for a healing, I encourage you to be wonderfully amazed at who Jesus is. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. seeing you next week up here at Orchardville Community Church. Remember, God loves you, and we do too. This is Gary Rayburn, and we'll talk at you later.